All right, Dan, we are officially three full months through the regular season. We've made our way into July, the trade deadline coming up in about four weeks. But this Red Sox team, as currently standing, 44 and 39 overall, five games above 500. They are in the wild card hunt. Dan, where do you think this team is currently at right now? I think, you know, and I have talked a lot, Joe, and, and one of the things a general manager always says is give me till Memorial Day to assess what we have. Well, they've, they've gone past that now, right? So we also have discussed on this very show the past couple of years falling into last place and things really falling off the cliff for this team. So now you sit here and, and you know, what, five games, six games above 500, uh, five games above 500. And, and I think you feel like, okay, they're in good shape as far as what they've accomplished so far. And now the second half of the season begins and there's questions to be answered, right? There's, uh, you know, we talked about starting pitching all year. Now the question is how much, if any, of a commitment will Craig Breslow in the front office be able to make through ownership in providing some more starting pitching? And can the guys on the staff get right? So I think to get to this point, you know, A plus for Alex Cora and company. Now, can they sustain, get over that hump, and make the playoffs? That'll be the biggest question here as we hit July, August, and into September. Yeah, and you hit on the starting pitching, which to me, Dan, seems like the biggest focal point to add if you are the front office, right? Because of where the starting rotation is is currently standing in the way that these guys have performed. I mean, Brian Bayo, Dan, he's, he's had a really rough, you know, five, six start stretch here. His ERA is over five and a half. And then you have a lot of guys like Tanner Houck, Cutter Crawford that are slowly creeping toward the, their, their max innings that they've pitched in their professional careers. So the, the starting rotation is in an interesting spot, but where, where do you think this group is, is currently at right now um, from your viewpoint? Well, guys that you need to rely on have to get right. That's the best way to put it too. And, and the biggest concern who's, you know, gets contract, a big contract is Brian Bayo. So if me, maybe I'm the Red Sox, I, I bring in Pedro Martinez for a week. You know, and just let him sit with him uh, every day and talk baseball, talk about pitching, talk philosophy, what he's doing, what he's throwing, what he's not throwing well, why it's not working. And just maybe kind of let him, uh, you know, tutor and, and, and help him kind of get through what he's what he's gone through. You know, so it's like, OK, is this a physical ailment? Well, no, it looks like he's, he's you know, may, they're backing him off a little bit. So mentally, what does he have to do to get right? I think so, uh, that's the first thing I would do when it comes to because you need him to be better than he has been you don't need him to be an ace right now you just need him to be a major league starting pitcher same goes for Nick Pavetta who's been inconsistent we've seen just how good he can be in the second half of last season he needs to do that again and then if they can continue to do that then maybe ease up a little bit on Tanner Houck uh, because he's you know thrown so many innings so far over 100 uh, and he's not used to that in his, in his career so there's lots of things that need to be fixed and the other thing I would be doing if I was Craig Breslow today is finding pitchers, whether it be through the waiver wires, whether it be through guys that he's liked over the years that he think he can maybe get from a triple-A team or, 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 or a team that's really struggling in the standings. Maybe one or two acquisitions where you're not mortgaging the farm, but enough to say to this team right now, we believe in you and start early. You know, so often it comes down, the price goes up and up and up towards the trade deadline. Start making a few moves now to get some arms in here to help out this pitching staff. Yeah, and, and it is a cause for concern because the, the starting pitching ERA, it was just south of five in the month of June, which was the highest of any of the full months. And we know how good this group was at the beginning of the year. So it is a little concerning. And even a guy like Tanner Houck, who, as you and I have talked about a million times, he's an all-star. He probably deserves to be the starting pitcher in the all-star game. You know, hopefully he can bounce back with, with this, this next outing coming up to get his numbers in a better spot. But, you know, listen, on Saturday, he really struggled. And you worry about him because his max in inning was, was in 2018 when he was in high A Salem. Dan, that's when I watched him in high A when I was broadcasting in minor league baseball. <laughs> so a long time ago. And so I, I think that this group is one that definitely needs to be bolstered. Although I do want to give a shout out to Josh Winkowski because he did pitch really well on Sunday after getting uh, recalled up recently from AAA Worcester. One part of the weekend I thought was super interesting was the return of Xander Bogarts. And there was this, this picture of him, Dan, at, after the, the, the final game of the series where he's just hanging over the railing, watching the Red Sox celebrate their win, and then he tips his cap to Alex Cora and uh, Rafael Devers. 
What did you make of, of the whole weekend with Xander coming back to Fenway for the first time since that big contract he signed with the Padres and his comments throughout the weekend about being back in Boston? Well, I, you know, to me, I thought it was kind of sad, you know, to, to watch Xander come in here. Granted, he wasn't playing. and Granted, he has almost the same injury that t- uh, Story has for the Red Sox with that f- shoulder fracture. But, you know, again, I go back to – and I got a lot of feed, uh, feedback from social media when I, you know, sent out on X the picture that Pete Abe took of him, uh, Bogarts in the dugout, uh, but just saying, you, you know, get over it. It was the best move the Red Sox made because they're not paying him that Whopper contract, what have you. I think – and, Joe, we've talked about this a lot over the course of the years. The Red Sox – have made mistakes along the way and every, every ownership group, every management group has, uh, but, you know, not being able to come to a, a deal with John Lester was a big one uh, and, and letting him, you know, hit the market finally and being traded and what have you is that they screwed those negotiations off. They tried to get too cute with him where Lester he told me he, he would have settled for a, a much less lesser deal just to be here. And I, I think the same thing, you screw that up with Xander Bogarts, Multiple times, as we've talked before, they had a chance to go back to spring training when they signed Trevor Story just around that time and said to him, look, you know, we're going to sit you down here. You're going to be our shortstop for now, but Story may eventually be there. We may move you to third, DH, what have you, but we want you to be our Patrice Bergeron of this Red Sox team. We want you to stay in Boston, be a Red Sox lifer, and lead this team. Multilingual, you know, he just had all those qualities that you want in a leader. And I just think that they screwed it up. And to me, I think Xander's sad. You know, he got his money out in San Diego. But realistically, Joe, and and nothing bad about the market out there, but it's just nowhere near the market that Boston is. And he fit really well here. And you can tell how much joy and love he still has for the Red Sox, for Alex Cora. And that you can tell he wanted to be here. He didn't want to leave. You know what I mean? So it's just like, I I just really felt bad for that guy because it was a sad situation. It takes two to tango and everything. But I still believe they could have easily gotten a deal done to keep him in a Red Sox uniform forever, and they didn't. I thought it was funny when he talked about how he was surprised. People still were were showing him so much love when he was walking the streets of Boston, but but that's what this town is for its sports heroes, and especially when you win here. And, Dan, what I thought made Xander so unique is that he was a homegrown player for one, but he was truly everything you'd want in uh, a member of this community and then on top of that a player for one of the professional teams here because he carried himself with so much class he could handle the pressure which he did right away as a 20 year old and 21 year old in that rookie season when he started every game of the world series and he also found a way to get better as his year as his years progressed here in boston he was he was good at the beginning then he kind of slumped a little bit in 2014 where they moved him around the field and then he became an offensive threat and then he became a nice defensive shortstop as well. So his, his career arc here was super unique. And and I think there is an emotional connection that this area is always going to have with Xander, even though he's now going to play, you know, likely the rest of his career in San Diego. Well, yeah, you go back and you look at, he was groomed. He was part of a group that came up through the Red Sox farm system. And one of the things is you always notice with these guys, is just how well behaved they were how they treated other people, how much they were loved within the organization. You know, I remember uh, Raquel Ferrero has done a, an amazing job with this Boston Red Sox team. She would keep them all in line as minor leaguers. And when they came up here, they were ready to be players, but they were more so ready to be people that could lead. And I think that's what you want in a sports franchise now because it's so hard to do and it's hard to get them. And then you go back and look at it and you say, all right, who should be the franchise players of this Red Sox team? Xander Bogarts is one and Mookie Betts is the other. And I know money is a big thing in long-term deals or what have you, but if you had those two guys as the face of this franchise, uh, you, you'd probably be winning a lot more and, and things might be different. So, uh, again, hard is not my money, especially in the Mookie situation as to whether or not he really wanted to stay or go out and test what have you. But if you had thrown that boatload of money at Mookie, he would have probably stayed. And in hindsight, when you look back on it, it's like, you know, the the the, the price isn't going down in, in any of these sports, Joe. So, You could have got him what now is probably a reasonable deal compared to all the others that are going out there and are going to continue to go out there all the way through. So those are the kind of things that's hard when you're in the moment. But as an ownership group, you just wish that they had made this decision to to trust the people in the organization that that made them into what they are and then trust the people that who are they are in Bogarts and Betts and made them the face of your franchise for, for many, many years. Dan, did you see what Alex Cora said when he was asked what his favorite Xander Bogarts moment was? What was it? 
He said he started the answer off with two words. Oh yes, Garrett Cole. Garrett Cole. <laughs> awesome, right? Twenty twenty one wild card game got the whole place jumping after hitting that two run home run to dead center. And that's kind of like the, the best part of those guys, you know. And and like you said, he'll Xander surprised that people recognize what have you, Xander. You won two World Series championships when you were here. You'll always be remembered. We've seen that now with the Celtics group, Tatum and Brown and and D. White and Horford and Porzingis, they'll always be remembered and, and renowned with all those rest of those Celtics because they won a World Series championship here. The Red Sox, the Celtics won a World Championship. You, you're remembered for that more than anything else in this town, and that's kind of a cool thing that Xander Bogarts will always have in his life. Well, shifting gears to a guy that the Red Sox did ink to a long-term contract, they extended him last year to a very long-term deal, and Rafael Devers, Dan, he had four home runs this homestand, and I, I thought this was my, my my favorite stat among the four home runs that he hit. Well, first he hit his longest home run of his professional career on Tuesday a, in the big leagues. And then on top of that, the four home runs, they, they combined for 1,712 <laughs> feet. I mean, I know he's a, he, his nickname is Carita, so it's babyface, but this, this guy's a full-grown, in-his-prime player right now, and the Red Sox need him more than ever, and he's delivered yeah, I mean, again, we talk about the maturity of a player and coming up through the franchise and what they do uh, to watch Rafi Devers do what he does. And we've talked about this time and again, too, to really not have much protection around him in that lineup. Uh, it, it's been pretty special, and he seems to be getting better and better. And that's the cool part with a guy like him is just watching him play every single day, watching his at-bats. You know, and I think it was Will Middlebrooks on Ness who said the other day, he leads the league in facial expressions. You know what I mean? He's just fun to watch. And that's a guy, Joe, that, again, we talk about ticket sales and how tough they've been for this Red Sox franchise. You have kids that want to want to emulate him, right? You have kids that, you know, make the faces and look around and look at him and say, I want to see Rafi Devers. I want to see him hit because of just he's a joy to watch hit because of his facial expressions, because of his attack mode. And, and you're not going to get it by him. He's going to battle you to the end. And I think it's been fun to watch the maturation in front of our eyes. So that's exactly what you want out of a guy like him. He's stepped up. He's done it. And hopefully those, there's more of those guys on the horizon that we keep hearing and reading about and Meyer uh, and, and as well as uh, uh, Kyle Teal and just all these kids that you're hoping can join this group and this current group and become better and better as a franchise. I wish everybody that had a baby face could hit uh, 400 foot plus home runs. Otherwise, I'd be a multimillionaire. Right, you'd be leading the league. <laughs> <laughs> Before we go, Dan, I, I I thought this would be fun to talk about since the the Sox are going to be playing the Marlins coming up here. And this Marlins team, it's a pretty nondescript team. You and I were just joking about it. there. There's not a lot of uh, before we hopped on about the lack of recognizable faces on this Marlins team. But I thought it would be fun to go back into the time machine and revisit one of the biggest trades of the last two decades that this organization has made. And that was when they traded for Josh Beckett and Mike Lowell and got them from the Marlins. They sent away some pretty good prospects back, two of them being uh, Hanley Ramirez and Anibal Sanchez, who turned into very productive big league players. Yep. But this trade was made in November of 2005. And, you know, looking back on it, a pretty bold trade to make when you're dealing away some of the top guys in your farm system. But it paid off, obviously, because the Sox won a World Series in 07. I wanted to, to, to go back into the time machine with you, though, because you experienced this as a reporter with the station. You know, what was it like for you when this trade went down and what was going through your mind when it actually went down? Well, you remember, Joe, going back then, that was it was everything. The Red Sox were, you know, right in the thick of they had finally won and broken the curse after 86 years in 04, struggled in 05 because they just couldn't get to the level they needed to and they had injuries and shilling and what have you. In 2006, 2007, those were the years that they sustained and, and turned over the roster a lot and, and got guys in here to help them win another championship. And this was Theo Epstein resigned on, on Halloween night that year, right? So uh, I remember being trick-or-treating in my neighborhood and I got a phone call saying, what? And I had to come into WBZ to, to do reports because Theo had resigned, left in a gorilla suit, as we find, find out, right? <laughs> the and then story. the Red Sox were run at that point by, you know, Larry Lucchino uh, was, was sending up. And then Ben Charrington and Jed Hoyer were named co-general managers, two guys that are still general managers now in, the, in, this, in this business or president of baseball ops, whatever you call them now. Um, and then there were two other guys that I, I can't remember, uh, Amiel Sade, who went on to the Arizona Diamondbacks and, and Pete, another kid who went to Major League Baseball. So the four guys were running. They flew me. The station flew me out 
with my photographer, Terry McNamara, and we flew to Los Angeles, drove to Palm Springs an hour and a half where the general manager meetings were going on. And I got a phone call, never forget, from the then PR Sox director, Glenn Geffner, because we had flown out saying that we could sit down with Lucino and Tom Warner and get their thoughts on Theo resigning and everything else. And we're halfway to Palm Springs on the drive. And Glenn calls and says, what's the worst thing I could tell you right now? And I'm like, what? He goes, Tom and Larry just left on a plane uh, to get out of here. So <laughs> we came in there, slept over that night and did a, an interview with the, the four horsemen as they came walking through the lobby and what have you and got their thoughts. But then they pull off the, the trade of trades. And, and it was a gamble by Lucino and Ben Charrington and Hoyer and company to bring in Mike Lowell, who was really a throw in in that trade because he was making a lot of money and hadn't had a, had a bad year. Uh, but then he came on to be one of their best players, was the World Series MVP in 2007. And then Josh Beckett, who was the World Series MVP in 2003, he came in and was dominating in 2007 and, and was the ALCS MVP in 2007 and helped them win a World Series. So that's a trade that we talk about prospects, Joe, all the time, right? You know, you, you got to make the right move with the right guys. It was a perfect move for this franchise and helped them to become, many will argue, that was right up there as maybe the best Red Sox team of the four that's won the World Series, where they had all the young guys coming in and Pedroia and Ellsbury to go along with a veteran like Mikey Lowell, who fit Boston so well on and off the field. He had 120 RBI in, in 2007, and it just hit behind Manny and David. And it was a perfect combination there. And then Beckett was that ace that they were they, they needed to go along with. John Lester was battling his cancer issues. They had Dice K. They can't come in, so it took pressure off him. So Beckett was perfect for Boston. He loved pitching in Boston. He maybe didn't show it sometimes the way he came across in the media, but I, him and I got along great because we flew to Texas uh, from the winter meetings in Dallas up to his home and did an interview with him right after he was acquired. So I had many great conversations and times with Beckett and Mikey Lowell. So for me, it was a joy to watch those two blossom in Boston, and it turned out to be a great trade for everybody involved. Uh, it, it really was a risky trade from Lucino, Charrington, and Hoyer. A couple quick things off of that, Dan. I'll ask you this. Do you think that Cleveland intentionally had Josh Beckett's ex-girlfriend sing the national anthem of Game 5 of the ALCS? Absolutely, 150,000%. <laughs> it was tremendous, and it was the best. Because I remember going up to Papelbon afterwards, and I did an interview with him to find out. He, was, he goes, you don't think that fired him up? What are they thinking here in Cleveland? These guys, you know, it was, it was awesome. That team was fun. And, man, what are you doing? What are you getting the ex-girlfriend of Josh Beckett to sing the national anthem? You don't think that Stokes an athlete is about to take them out? Like, what are we thinking? You know what I mean? So it's just, like, it was pretty good. And especially a competitor like Josh Beckett, too, who has already won a World Series, was, was known as one of the clutch pitchers of his generation. And, of course, he goes out there and shoves against Cleveland and Sox end up winning that in uh, seven games. So <laughs> it backfired, whether it was intentional or not, it did backfire. And, Dan, one more thing about that trade. I, I didn't remember this until I went back and looked up some articles about the trade. But the, the Rangers actually were were one of the front runners at the time to, to land Josh Beckett. And the, the, the Rangers at the time, they were offering Hank Blaylock and one of their top pitching prospects, one of them being Josh Danks. But then they receive a call from the Marlins that, they, that they're that they going in a different direction. What may have hung up the deal, though, was Florida asked the Rangers to add uh, Joaquin Arias to the deal, who was a, a shortstop prospect. And in return, the Rangers, they wanted a, a second pitcher back in it, and they just couldn't come to terms with it. So it's, it's, it's always interesting what maybe could have happened and where – the baseball history could have gone if, say, Josh Beckett goes to the Rangers instead of the Red Sox. But it's a credit to, to Theo and, and that organization that they they stacked the farm system as as much as they did to have the prospects. And then on top of that, just everybody in that organization to pull the trigger when the time came. And I think that's an interesting thing to look back on considering now where we're at. Yeah, and knowing which players to give up, that's the other critical part, too, because you look back on it and you're like, Hanley Ramirez, that was tough, yes. But you had to give up something to get something, right? And to throw Annabelle Sanchez, you said, I think he won 116 games in, a, in his big league career. So he, he was good. But knowing what, okay, we can move this, we can move that, knowing the depth of your organization and knowing the players that you think are going to be the players to target, I think that's probably one of the more difficult things that a general manager and, and a front office and baseball ops has to go through, right, is, is which guys can we afford to give up? Is 
is Joe Weil better than Dan Roach? Is Dan Roach better than Joe Weil? And you better be right, right? Because you don't want to make that trade and then you live it, you know, for the next 20 years because that person went on to become this ridiculous player and it maybe backfired on you. Or did you make the right call, send the right guys and get a deal done, which Texas wasn't able to, and that might have changed their organization. And instead, the Red Sox just reloaded with what they had and regrouped and won another World Series in 2007. So, yeah, those decisions are, are pretty uh, pretty risky, but it's part of the risk-reward of being a general manager. And it's cool always to look back on what you gave up and what you didn't have to give up. And the memories that they ended up bringing, right? Because 2007 doesn't happen without both of those guys. You yeah. can just argue that they're the two biggest reasons that the Red Sox ended up winning the World Series that year when you look back at that postseason run. But uh, we'll see how it goes now for this current version of the Red Sox as we enter the month of July and we inch closer and closer to the trade deadline. Dan and I will be there the entire way talking about it. Dan, appreciate the happy, time. Yeah, happy 4th of July to everybody out there. Enjoy, stay safe in the fireworks and have a glass or two of fruit punch, which you've already had, Joe, and <laughs> just go out there and, and have, have yourself a great time and a safe, happy 4th of July. <laughs> Thanks, Dan.